What's up guys? It's your girl, Gemma Jade. Just here for another true crime story. When I first heard about this story and saw it on YouTube and started researching it and read about it, I thought it's pretty cut and dry. It's pretty simple. Um, and it would be just a quick video I can put out to put out some content while I work on the Brittany Bashirs and Aaron Gillen cases. It took me a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> so I'm not 100% sure, but I have a feeling that this might be a little bit longer of a video than what I normally put out. Um, but I'll try to keep it below the hour mark so we don't have to go into like part two. Um, it is the case of the foster son, the four-year-old Andrew Bird, who was who died from salt poisoning. And about, I guess, his family, his foster family, and about the mother, Hannah Overton, who was charged with the murder and the purposeful salt poisoning of this little boy. It's kind of a wild ride. Um, I don't want to offend anybody. This is about a special needs child. It's about a child in the foster care system. And it's about a very religious Christian family. Um non-denominational, which I am a non-denominational Christian. I don't talk about it often online, but it is a very big part of my life. Um, so usually when I start a story like this, we focus on the victim of the crime, but because of what happens at the end, at the very end, I thought it necessary to talk a little bit about the mother, um, the foster mother, Hannah, and where she came from. Throughout this video, I'm not going to keep saying foster parent. I'm just going to say mother and father because that's what Andrew called them um, at the time that he died. So I want to give you a little bit of background information on the mother, Hannah, and then we'll get into Andrew's background and the entire Overton family and what happened on that tragic day in October of 2006. So let's get into it. Hannah Overton was born Hannah Sands. I could not find her birthday. She was the daughter of Reverend Benny Sands and homemaker Lane Sands. From a very early age, people said that she had this real sense of community and she would go to church all the time, every chance she got, not only to listen to her father preach, but also because she always loved the community of it. She she wanted to be a part of the large family. She was only one of two children. She had a brother seven years her junior, so younger than her. And she always wanted to be a part of the larger families. She had a heart for people in need from a very young age as well. At a young age, she also was friends with all the other children in her father's small congregation. And one of those children's name was Larry Overton who she ends up marrying later on in life. In 1984, though, everything changed for Hannah Sands and her family when her father, the Reverend Benny Sands, was arrested and convicted of a 16-year-old girl who was found naked and bludgeoned to death on the water's edge of Padre Island. And I looked up where is Padre Island in Texas. And it says, Padre Island is a national seashore or park located just outside of Corpus Christi, Texas that includes about 70 miles of natural beaches and habitats. From the outside looking in, everyone said this family looked totally normal. But her father was arrested and charged with this crime and eventually convicted. The evidence against him was irrefutable, with blood from the victim being found in her father's van and him not having an alibi for that night, or uh, his alibi not checking out is actually what I read. Obviously, the sudden fall from grace deeply affected the family. Lane had to move her two children into another town in Texas. He was sentenced to 23 years in prison, and obviously he could not be around for his family anymore, and this profoundly affected Hannah as well. Her and her mother and her brother had to move to Lindale, Texas, which is right outside of Corpus Christi. As They moved to Lindale because a missionary committee called the Calvary Commission gave them free room and board, 
in a small but lovely little apartment. Hannah babysat and looked after children of the congregation of these of these missionaries and the grandchildren of some of these missionaries as well. She loved kids. She had this incredible patience with them. The founder of this commission's name was Joe Faust, F-A-U-S-S, -S, and he said about Hannah, quote, In all the years she was here, I can't recall one negative thing being said about her, end quote. As a teenager, she was captivated by stories of missionaries and the work they did abroad. She really loved helping out in the community. And again, she had a heart for the down and out, the out of luck. She was really um, invested in her faith as a Christian. And we are called to treat others as Jesus treated us, to forgive others. And we are called to serve. We are called to serve our Lord as he serves and served us. And she took that very, very seriously. And that's what she did. From a young child to a teenager in the Calvary Commission and, and up, she always knew that she wanted a huge family. Later on in her life, she reunited with Larry Overton when she moved back to Corpus Christi. It doesn't say when or why, but they did reunite and they ended up getting married very young. And they talked right from the beginning about having a large family and Hannah even spoke about wanting to have either one or two non-biological children, one at least with special needs. I forgot to mention also that she would also spend Easter's and Christmases at the orphanage where most of the children there were the product of the prostitutes from the close by red light district. And these kids felt abandoned and forgotten, but Hannah had a heart for them. She loved these children. She loved being around them. She just, she thought they were wonderful and they loved her back. So that brings us back to Larry and Hannah's marriage. The reason I brought all of this up again is so that you can kind of get a sense and a feel for the character of the woman that we are going to be discussing in this story. Um, despite what her father did, she held on tight to her Christian beliefs and her family and she let her love of people and her love of God move and motivate her. Some things are going to come up that are kind of questionable. And I just want you to be able to make your own decision about it based on knowing all of the facts. Now, let's talk about the real victim in this case, four-year-old Andrew Bird. So, he was born on July 28th, 2002. There's very little known about his biological parents, his biological mother was 16 years old when she had him and she was addicted to multiple substances, including marijuana, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, alcohol, and cigarettes. And she did all these things while she was pregnant with abandon. She did not care that she was pregnant. The biological father was also addicted to several substances. He was only 17 years old and he was really never around because he worked for a traveling carnival. Those existed in 2002. Like, you go on the road with a carnival? I didn't know that. The maternal grandmother was around, but she also could not take custody of little Andrew because she as well had many addictions and one of them was to methamphetamine. The next thing I read about this is that after four investigations into the mother and or grandmother, CPS finally got involved when at the age of two and a half, little Andrew was brought to the hospital with a broken arm. The doctors noticed that there was abuse and neglect going on in the home and called Child Protective Services. What I want to know is this was 2002, right? Um, why didn't they step in when the baby was born addicted? I mean, that doesn't really make any sense, right? Don't they just step in and like try and take your kid or at least separate the birth mother from the child right away when the child's born addicted. I don't understand that. And no matter how much I looked and researched, I just couldn't figure out why it took two and a half years and four visits to the hospital emergency room for CPS to finally get involved. So Andrew started out as a member of the congregation that Larry and Hannah Overton attended as a foster child to one of the women there. I don't know if it was a couple. They only mentioned the woman. And later on, only the woman was interviewed after everything that happened happened. Larry taught Sunday school there. 
and Hannah did a Bible study. Larry and Hannah's two of their biological children, which they had four at this point in time, were in the same Sunday school class as little Andrew. And every week when it would come time for prayer time, the two overheard Andrew praying very hard every single week without fail for a forever home to be adopted. And I guess having a heart like their mom and their dad for community and for an, an underdog kind of, and for the less fortunate, that's the words I was looking for, they went back and talked to their parents about Andrew maybe becoming a part of their family. Mom, Dad, how about you adopt a little Andrew? He wants a forever home so bad and we really like him. Can he be our brother? That's essentially what I read kind of went down in the house. So it was these two young children with a heart for their friend Andrew and they wanted him to be their brother and they brought his prayers to the attention of their parents. Larry and Hannah Overton. So this was around 2004, 2000, like the middle of 2004, almost 2005. The Overtons discussed it and thought about it. And in 2005, they decided to really go for their dream of adopting not only a child, but a special needs child. And they actually took, you know, the recommendation from their youngest, younger children and decided to go forward with trying to adopt little Andrew Bird. So the first thing Larry and Hannah did was inquire about little Andrew to the current foster mom and just all around the church to kind of get a feel for what his story and situation was before they contacted, I guess, CPS or the state to go ahead and start the adoption process. They heard from many members of the congregation that they should, quote, Think of your other children, end quote, essentially because it was known that young Andrew had very violent, extremely violent temper tantrums, many behavioral disorders. He was developmentally delayed in many ways. The pastor and his wife, the pastor of this congregation and his wife and his family were going to take Andrew in, but they told the Overtons that his disabilities were even too much for them. But the Overtons prayed about it and they thought about it and they talked to the current foster mom and they met with CPS to start the trial adoption period, which in this period would be a six month fostering period where they would foster him for the six months, see how it went, and then decide if they wanted to proceed with the adoption. Again, Hannah had an uncanny patience for children and they decided despite all of this, all he needed was their love and the Lord to guide them. And they were just overcome with joy at this opportunity that they felt God had kind of thrown right into their lap. The whole family was excited. At this time, right when they contacted CPS and started to proceed with the fostering slash adoption process, Hannah found out she was also pregnant with another one of their biological children. This means it was the two adults, and it was now going to be six children in the house on just Larry Overton's salary. He was a landscape lighting technician. That was the best description of his job that I can find. I'm, I'm not sure what that is enough to explain it, and I don't really think it's relevant. The reason I bring it up is because it was mentioned that he could hardly make ends meet for himself, his wife, his wife, and the four children they had now. So I guess Hannah was not going to be able to work. At this point, she was homeschooling the children, but they figured, you know what? God never gives us more than we can handle and we're gonna go forward. They were overjoyed. I just wanna talk for a minute about what little Andrew's known, dis known disabilities and delays were so that you can kind of get a feel for what the Overtons were about to kind of get themselves into this is all of the known issues and delays and, and problems that he had that the Overtons were told about from the very beginning. Some developmental delays in speech and motor skills. He spoke very slowly and haltingly a lot of the time, most of the time, in fact, with a stutter. He couldn't put more than a couple of words together at once. He couldn't really say sentences. 
like maybe two, three words at a time, but no sentences at this point. He hoarded food. He would take food out of the trash. He was described also as a very angry kid who threw terribly violent temper tantrums over the smallest little things. He would also hide food in random places throughout the house to make sure that it was there if he got hungry. These are the most noticeable and reported on issues with that the little boy had going on into this arrangement, going into this arrangement with the Overtons all that they were made aware of and they decided again we can handle it we got this let's go forward despite being financially strapped emotionally stressed they really wanted to help this little boy even with the non curable delays i guess andrew had and they did not specify um the sources that i read or watched when they said this they they still wanted to go forward i know i said that like four times i'm sorry my notes are a little mixed up so bear with me in the spring of 2006, it was actually Mother's Day to be exact, little Andrew Bird spent his first night in the Overton home. Everybody was super excited and they knew that his favorite um, superhero cartoon character, his favorite thing in the world at the moment, um, as an almost four-year-old boy, was Spider-Man. So they decked everything out in Spider-Man, sheets, blankets, pillowcases, um, toothbrush, plates, cups, bowls, silverware, pajamas, sneakers, you name it. If they made it of Spider-Man action figures, they went out and got it for little Andrew. So he would be even more excited about his big move to his most likely final forever home. Andrew got attached to the family right away, almost immediately calling Hannah mommy and Larry daddy. And he would literally like what's that called flat tire when you step on the back of someone's shoe and like make the shoe go down he was on larry's heels so much he just adored him and admired him like most little boys do for their dads i know rj does that with ray all the time um he just adored this family and they adored him back they loved this little boy and they felt even more promise from the first night on with how wonderful he was getting along also, to the outside world, to neighbors and congregants, it seemed Andrew was really doing so much better. Socially, his interaction with the other children in the church was, was much more positive. His language skills were getting better. His stutter was almost completely gone, and he was putting together full sentences. Also, he seemed, seemed very much more well-behaved than he had previously when he was staying with the other foster mother. So on the outside looking in, things were going beautifully. Everyone said what an amazing change they saw in little Andrew. Even the adoption supervisor expressed in her report that she was extremely pleased with Andrew's progress in the house and that it seemed to be the perfect fit for all parties involved, the parents, young Andrew, and the biological children. As we know, though, outside appearances can be, and in my experience, usually are quite deceiving. Inside the Overton home was a different story than what it seemed to the outside. While, yes, Andrew was doing a lot better with his speech delays and his, his speech problems and communicating with the other children and making all of these amazing and positive changes, it wasn't very long before he started hoarding food, throwing violent temper tantrums, hiding food around the house, eating food out of the trash, so all the behaviors that everyone had warned the Overtons about started and to a much um, a much higher degree than what they were told about. The Overtons noticed that at now four years old, Andrew would also spend much more time and was better able to communicate with their two-year-old instead of the four-year-old that they had in the house. So he was still very severely developmentally delayed. The Overtons, you know, they knew they had a long road to recovery with Andrew, and this was only a few months after he started, so they were not discouraged. They continued to press forward positively through prayer and support from their congregation, neighbors, community, and family, and they decided, you know, they're not going to give up. He's, you know, a little bit worse for the wear than they had originally thought, but they still felt it was a right fit, and with their love and patience, they would persevere. They would get through. 
because of how Andrew was born, his motor skills were severely delayed from the very beginning, being born addicted to that many substances. Hannah said she was so worried mainly about how clumsy he was. She even made him wear an inflatable life vest in the toddler kiddie pool outside of the house when he would play in the pool with the other kids because she was so scared of his extreme clumsiness. Hannah also said that Andrew was a very busy kid. He took up all of her time. She was never able to focus on her other children. Um, she insinuated kind of what it sounded like to me, and this is my speculation, was that he was like kind of ADHD or ADD, which I don't agree with for a child that young, but he was constantly on the go, constantly getting into something. There was never a moment's peace. In my opinion, that's a toddler though. RJ isn't four yet. I've been around four-year-olds. Usually they are more calm than two-year-olds, but that's my biggest thing with RJ. It's like I never get to sit down for more than five minutes. That's being a mama. I cannot imagine having five other kids, young kids at that, one of them with severe, you know, problems as well. I mean, I don't know how she did it. I know at some point the children did go back to school, and that's important to mention for when we get to the day in question. Out of all of these issues and problems and delays, the most disruptive and frustrating to the family was the food issues. At this point, he was just hoarding and eating from the trash. It was so bad that they couldn't take him along on simple errands to the store because if they were in a grocery store, he would just pull off food off the shelves and start eating. He would eat off of the floor. He would randomly open things up and start eating from containers. He went as far as numerous times to try and peel gum off the sidewalk and eat that. The kid obviously had some kind of issues with food. And from what I read, and I'm not claiming to be an expert in any way on children or any of this stuff, um, I'm not any kind of psychologist or social worker yet, um, it's pretty common for children that grew up in the foster care system or that are subject to so much neglect and abuse as, as Andrew allegedly was early in his life to have food issues like this. He would even get up in the middle of the night and go to, I guess, the refrigerator and start hiding food around the house, hoarding food in his room, under his blankets, in his bed. He would chip paint off the walls and eat that. He would eat cigarette butts out of ashtrays. I don't know if the Overton smoked, um, but it says he ate cigarette butts. So some problems there, right? He would go into the trash in the middle of the night if he couldn't get into the fridge. He just never stopped eating and he also ate things that weren't food. So as you can imagine, this child was probably a major headache, especially for Hannah, who was home with him all day with the other children. And in my opinion, before I even knew what happened, I said, this is an accident waiting to happen. It's mentioned br very briefly that Hannah had some kind of background in nursing. The reason I bring this up is it's very important because it's going to come into question some of her actions on the day that the incident took place. But all I saw was she had a background in nursing. I never saw she went to college or school of any kind. So I'm wondering if this was when she would take care of the homeless and the orphans and she learned something. I don't know what her background in nursing is and it's really frustrating. If any of you can find it, please put it in the comments. Um, just so I'm aware, I obviously I can't go back and put it in this video, but her actions are going to come into question. And the reason is because she supposedly had this background in nursing. So she thought she knew a little bit how to handle and cope with these behaviors and to teach young Andrew how to cope without throwing violent temper tantrums and feeling that he needed to eat to cope with whatever problem he was experiencing in the moment to try to teach him to be normal and well-adjusted. No matter how much Andrew ate or how much food he was given, immediately after eating, if he was denied thirds or fourth portions, he would fly into extremely violent tantrums. And there was no calming him down if you didn't give him more food. And it didn't matter how much you gave him. I can't stress that enough. The Overtons eventually said that this was the most disruptive because it caused them to have concern for their other children. 
Andrew was violent towards anyone and anything, everyone and everything that got near him. He would slam his head against walls. He would do this other behavior that I'm going to talk about in a little while that like, I don't know if I'd be able to put up with it even from a developmentally challenged child, but this isn't about me. So eventually they did decide to take him to the doctor and to take him to see the adoption therapist or specialist that was overseeing their case because it wasn't getting any better. It actually seemed like it was getting worse and they really needed some professional help. At first, the doctors told him that told them that the eating and tantrums were behavioral issues and they were not medical issues. And they were even shown statistics by the adoption specialist and her supervisor stating that almost all children that go through this indeed do eventually grow out of it. And this reassured the family and it gave them new hope that if they would just hang in there and be patient and keep trucking on, that they would eventually be able to find some common ground with little Andrew and to help him. All they wanted to do, in my opinion, from what I read and what I saw about these people, all they wanted to do was help this little boy get over his issues. Eventually, though, the constant, and I mean constant eating of non-food items like cigarette butts, gum off the ground, cat food, paint chips, he even started eating the rugs in their house, like pulling pieces of rug out and eating it. It became a huge concern, and they had to take him to a medical professional at that point and a psychiatric professional at that point because at this point they are not convinced that this is just a behavioral issue they were feeling they were feeling desperate discouraged and hopeless and again they were convinced they were, these were not just behavioral issues that there had to be something more wrong he did it whether they were in public or in private whether he was by himself or with a group of people it didn't matter he never stopped eating I'm seeing in my notes that I forgot to put the date of the accident. So the Overtons were in, the entire family were in a very kind of benign car accident. But this triggered Andrew. And this took place before everything that I just said. I'm really sorry. This is what triggered him to start eating pieces of the carpet and chewing on his clothes. And the behaviors got like a million times worse. Even though nobody was hurt, everyone came out of it uninjured except for Hannah she had some whiplash put on bed rest until further notice which I guess was really hard so now she's back to not working the other kids are in school but she's home with Andrew and her younger toddler at this point it's 2006 at this point so they're still you know in the process of fostering young Andrew they're almost done with the adoption process but this small car accident terrified him and triggered him and his coping skills got even worse like now he had none he was back to stuttering he had completely regressed back to the little boy who had originally come into their home into their possession I guess um for lack of a better word and now Larry was back to supporting six children and two adults on his meager salary so they were financially strapped again emotionally stressed and as I said probably just discouraged and wondering what to do with not only this child but just in general had they made the wrong decision are they going to go forward with the adoption they did have family and friends that were willing to help them out watching the two kids while Hannah laid in bed and got rest but one by one neighbors other congregants friends, family members, they all were like, forget this mess and completely um, abandoned this family because they could not handle Andrew. They didn't want to be a part of it. They didn't want to be around. They physically could not help Hannah and her family anymore because young Andrew drove them all absolutely insane. So now Hannah was left on her own in the house when Larry went to work and the other four children went to school in extreme pain with whiplash, supposed to be on bed rest with Andrew Bird and their younger child, their youngest child. One morning, Larry decided because of tantrums that Andrew had thrown the night before at dinner, wanting fourth, fifth, sixth helpings and then trying to get into the trash with the sneaking into the fridge in the middle of the night, he had had it. 
and he was going to let Andrew eat as much as he wanted for breakfast. I'm pretty sure that the hope in this was to, one, teach him a lesson that he was going to throw up and get sick and decide that he was finally full, or let him eat just until he got full, and then he wouldn't want any more, and he would realize that there's enough food. So Larry made him a whole plate of sausage. I could never figure out how many sausages, but I know when I buy breakfast sausage, I think there's like 10 or 12 in the pack, and a whole dozen eggs. So 12 eggs, and I'm speculating, but 10 to 12 sausages, a whole plate. I'm not sure what gave Larry the idea, but I think it was the camera that they placed in little Andrew's bedroom because he was constantly going to the fridge and the garbage in the middle of the night to eat and eating the carpet and eating the paint off the walls that they had to, even in their sleep, constantly try to be on the lookout for what this child was doing in the middle of the night. God forbid they woke up and there was something wrong with him. They needed to be able to look at the camera and see what he had consumed. That's how bad this was. So they saw him eating pieces of his mattress foam when he couldn't get out of his bedroom. So he's eating carpet and mattress foam. So maybe this is what motivated Larry as well as the tantrums that continually went on day after day, morning after morning, night after night, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack. This kid was never satisfied when it came to food. So Larry makes him this dozen eggs and all these sausages, probably like 10 to 12, possibly more, a whole plate. And Andrew eats and he eats and he eats until he throws up. Then he goes back to the plate and continues to eat after he finishes all of the food, the whole plate of sausage, the dozen eggs, after he did throw up, he tries to eat the throw up and then begs and asks for more food. He still wasn't satisfied. It wasn't enough. How frustrating. He kept insisting he was still hungry and crying and throwing violent tantrum that he wanted more food, more food. And I think at this point, the Overtons were just like, enough is enough. We're going to find out what's going on here. And he took, they took him to the adoption specialist to get some advice, get some answers, and to find out what exactly was going on with Andrew. Remember, they were only foster parents at this point. They could not make any medical decisions for Andrew. They did not have custody. They only had physical custody of Andrew living in their house. They did not have legal custody. They could not make medical decisions, and they needed the specialist to help them make these appointments. They wanted answers. It had been long enough. They weren't seeing any progress. In fact, they were seeing regression. I'm sure they were just ready to give up. So they went to see this adoption. Some of it, some reports say therapist and some sources say specialist. So I wrote adoption therapist specialist. I don't know. Caseworker sounds more like it to me if we're dealing with CPS here. They even had to meet with the supervisor again. After all this time of seeing all these medical doctors, psychiatric professionals, all of these supposed specialists, it was thought now that maybe Andrew did have a medical condition and not a behavioral issue as was originally thought by everybody. Um, an appointment was made for Andrew to go see another medical doctor, a medical professional to be evaluated, to see if he had a condition called PICA or PICA. I think it's called PICA, but I'm not sure. It's pronounced P-I-C-A. And the definition is, quote, Craving and chewing eating substances that have no nutritional value, such as ice, clay, soil, or paper, end quote, i.e. mattress foam, cigarette butts, paint off the walls, and possibly gum off floors and sidewalks as well, I'm sure. I also read quickly, just when researching what pica is, that it can have causes that aren't due to an underlying disease. Like examples can include stress, um, cultural factors, nutritional deficiencies, or pregnancy. So stress, obviously, I'm sure this little boy had been through so much in his life, he was traumatized. He obviously wasn't pregnant. Cultural issues, he was a young Caucasian boy in a Caucasian household. I don't know what his previous um, foster families were. I just know of the one woman from this congregation. So that couldn't be it. 
I don't know if Andrew was ever checked for nutritional deficiencies. I think those appointments were made, but never able to be followed up on or followed through with because of what happened to this little boy. On October 2nd, 2006, Larry woke up early and took everyone, all of the other children besides Andrew to church with him and left Andrew home alone with Hannah because Hannah wanted some quality time with Andrew. She really loved this little boy and she felt bad for him. And as, as frustrated as she was, she really wanted to help him. She's always had this heart for the disadvantaged and needy and unfortunate throughout her whole life. And now she was charged with being a mama to one, to a little boy. And she wanted to spend some quality time with him. Larry made breakfast for everyone and everyone, the whole family ate breakfast together before Larry left. According to Hannah, immediately after the family left, Andrew started asking for lunch, saying he was starving and still hungry. And once again, he started begging for food, saying that he had not had enough during breakfast. Hannah told him and explained to him that he had to wait for lunchtime because Larry was going to bring a special lunch home for the entire family after church and everyone was going to sit as a family and have lunch together. Well, our young Andrew did not like this answer. Apparently, he never liked being told no. He would throw incredibly violent fits and just rage when he was told no to anything, especially when it came to the food. He went into full-blown toddler tantrum mode. He ran into his bedroom, okay? I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing because I'm thinking, oh my god. He proceeded to pull his clothes off and poop. Should I say make stinky? <laughs> proceeded to poop all over everything. The floors, he smeared it on the walls, on his bed, in his hair, on his body, on his clothes. There was poop everywhere and he did it on purpose. He did it intentionally. The kid had problems. He was in a rage and he was raging. And this, uh, unfortunately, was not the first time that young Andrew had done this. He had done this many times before. The parents, once again, had to throw out his bed sheets. They had to clean his mattress. Not to mention clean Andrew himself, who basically bathed himself in poopy. I can't even imagine how frustrating this would be, even knowing this child's issues. I mean, for this to keep happening over and over again on top of everything else, I'm sure it was a lot and it was overwhelming for the family, especially the parents. Remember, Hannah's still in a ton of pain from this car accident. They later came under some fire for how they handled this particular poop situation Because they said when later asked that when they throw his sheets into the garbage, I don't know if they were throwing it into an outside garbage or garbage inside the home, he would just go and get them and drag them back into the house and bring poop all over himself and everything else all over again after they had just cleaned it. The reason they had to explain this is because it was later found out that Larry actually burned the sheets. Now, I don't know if it was illegal to start a burn pile or have a burn bin where they were at this point, but he didn't. He didn't start a, a burn pile or a bonfire or a, put it in a burn bin. He burned it on their family's grill. And I honestly have to say, even with everything that I'm about to tell you happened and everything that's happened before, this is the one and only thing I find questionable. Like, why did he do this? Did he just get so freaking frustrated? He was just like... I'm going to burn them and I'm not going to have the police coming out here because I'm burning in the yard. So I'm going to burn them on our grill. I don't know. When people are under a lot of stress and stress and pressure, they do crazy things. This, I, as I said, was the only questionable thing that the Overtons did this entire time. I still don't understand it. They still can't explain it. They also came under some fire later on for the fact that since the mattress was now all covered in poop, they had to also clean the mattress off and the mattress was wet. I keep thinking I'm seeing something out of the corner of my eye, but it's my crazy shirt. So the mattress was wet. So they stripped the bed and 
On the night of the second, they made him sleep on nothing but the bed frame. A lot of people have said, why didn't they get an air mattress? Why didn't they let him sleep on the floor? Why didn't they let him sleep with one of the other kids? Probably to punish him so that he would stop pooping all over everything. I don't know why that's not obvious to some people, but I digress. Another thing they did that was questionable, that seems perfectly reasonable to me, was they stripped Andrew naked and they hosed him down in the yard I don't know if they then brought him inside to give him a shower, but imagine a poop-covered child. You just had to throw away sheets again. You hardly have enough money to make ends meet for your family. You're throwing away more sheets because this kid purposely and willfully dookied all over everything. You had to clean poop off of walls, floors, everything else. You're so angry. You burned the sheets on your grill, okay? You're trying to teach this kid a lesson. Do you want to really clean the poop out of your shower or your bathtub too? No, they hosed him off. I don't see what's wrong with it. Even Dr. Phil said that they were treating him like a dog by hosing him off. The neighbors were very upset about it later on, telling the police that they had done this. Honestly, guys, and respectfully disagree in the comments if you don't agree with me or my thoughts on this case or this situation, but I think it's perfectly reasonable to not want to also have to clean Dookie up after you just cleaned a ton of it. You're in pain because of whiplash. This kid is completely just terrorizing your entire family and your lives. They hosed him down in the yard. I don't think this was a very harsh punis punishment. And I think it was kind of reasonable to try to teach him that there are consequences to your actions. Just like they always rewarded him when he made progress or he listened really well. They were trying to teach him. They were trying to teach him, I'm sure, about consequences. I'm not sure. That's speculation. But that's what it seems like to me. I mean, otherwise, they were perfectly reasonable and rational, loving, patient, kind, people, Christians in general, and parents to this little boy as well as their own biological children. So the only reasonable explanation I can think of is they were trying to teach him a lesson. Young Andrew did not learn that lesson, as we'll see in the days to come. This brings us to the very next day after the poop, sheet burning, sleeping on bed frame, hosing Andrew down in the yard incident. It was October 3rd, 2006. Larry had gone to work. I guess the other four kids had went to school. And it was just Hannah, Andrew, and the smaller toddler. Remember, I know it seems like this is a long time because it's kind of a long video, but this is still in the six month period. So all of this is happening in a very short amount of time. So she's still in pain with the whiplash. She's still supposed to be on bed rest. So she takes little Andrew and another younger child in the house and she brings them into her room in bed with her so that they can watch cartoons and kind of play with each other while she just lays there and relax, relaxes. I don't think she intended to fall asleep, but that's exactly what happened. Hannah fell asleep with Andrew and the other child in bed with her watching cartoons and playing. I forgot to mention she did feed them breakfast before bringing them into the room to rest while also trying to keep an eye on them. That's important. They did eat breakfast, but you know what's coming next, right? Hannah said she fell asleep for what couldn't have been more than just a few short minutes. And when she woke up, her other child was there, but Andrew was not. He was not in the bed. He was not in the bedroom anymore. She jumped up in a panic and ran around the house and she found him in the kitchen, in the cupboards, and he was eating and gorging on baking ingredients. The reason I put that in quotations is I never understood why she couldn't say what he was gorging himself on. Like what, what did he get into? What did he eat? She just says baking ingredients. I know even if it's non-toxic, first of all, why aren't your cabinets locked? But even if it's non-toxic and I know that there's nothing but baking ingredients in the pantry that RJ got into and started eating, I'm still going to look at exactly what he ate and make a decision as a parent, knowing my child, on whether or not to take him to the doctor or hospital, depending on how much of this I thought he had consumed. But, you know, maybe in a lot of pain, maybe extremely tired, exhausted from everything going on. I can't even imagine. She just takes the ingredients, puts them back in the cupboard, cleans it up, and tries to get Andrew to go back into the bedroom while she relaxed. But Andrew is not having it, okay? Andrew is hungry. 
In fact, he's starving and he wants food. He wants lunch. He's insisting he's not taking no for an answer. Hannah told him no. She would. He would have to wait for lunchtime. Again, he didn't like this answer. And obviously, you know, he had learned nothing from the night before when he was hosed off and had to sleep on a bed frame for doing the dookie bit. This time he did his little poop dance in the kitchen. He rubbed poop everywhere while Hannah tried to stop him. He flung poop at her. He was screaming, violent tantrum, hitting his head. I mean, just the worst demon toddler tantrum you could possibly imagine. And I'm not saying Andrew was a demon. I said demon tantrum. Okay, so don't come for me. So Hannah was finally like, fine, you know what? I'm going to give you something. So she takes a sippy cup with some water and some Creole seasoning. Creole seasoning. Someone says Creole. Another person says Creole. I believe it's Creole seasoning. And she puts the seasoning in water in a sippy cup and gives it to Andrew. I'm assuming that this is just so she can get him to stop hounding her for food. And maybe the water and the flavoring, the seasoning would fill his little belly because water, you know, will, will temporarily fill you. But that didn't work. He chugged down the water and the seasoning and asked for more. He was hungry. He was starving. She was starving him more, more, more. Now she still has to clean up the poopy and the baking ingredients and she still has another toddler plus whiplash. I'm sure she's fed up and frustrated. She gives him another sippy cup of the water and creole seasoning. After this, he still wanted more and she put her foot down and she said, no, you will wait till lunch. He started throwing a violent, violent tant temper tantrum again, continuing this tantrum from before till eventually he started throwing up. Hannah thought that he was throwing up because probably the baking ingredients, which I still, it frustrates me to no end that she did not check to see what this child got into. Her life probably been, would have been a lot more simpler going forward had she, but the Creole seasoning, the water, the, the large breakfast that he had just had, and he was throwing up during this tantrum. She probably also thought he like got himself worked up. RJ's done it a couple of times where he got himself so worked up that he started vomiting. After about 20 minutes of this, though, she noticed that he was kind of doing something he never did before, which was calming himself down and chilling out. But she said he was kind of like too chill. He started breathing as though he was having an asthma attack, which he did not have asthma. She said after a few more minutes of watching him have this kind of asthma attack, he began struggling to breathe even more and he started exhibiting symptoms of a quote, sudden flu, end quote. I don't know what that means. Does that mean fever, chills, the vomiting? I don't know. The sources that I read just say sudden flu or flu-like symptoms. Suddenly he fell to the floor and was unresponsive. Hannah said she immediately put him and the other child in the car as fast as she possibly could and drove them to the nearest clinic, which either she or Larry, I'm not sure, later stated was just around the corner. However, upon pulling up into the parking lot of this clinic, Andrew fell into a coma. The doctors, unfortunately, were not able to save him. And the next day, October 4th, 2006, Andrew Bird died in the hospital at the age of four years old. It's really tragic. Do you guys see what questions are going to come up and where this is kind of headed? I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to think at this point. I just know that the only thing that seemed unreasonable to me that Hannah did or that the parents did was Larry burning those sheets on the grill that the family ate off of. So now you got stinky grill when you go to like cook your burgers. I, I don't know, but... I digress again, moving on, let it go, Gemma, let it go. The medical examiner who was in charge of young Andrew's autopsy concluded that toxic sodium levels had caused a brain bleed and test results showed that he had twice the level of normal sodium that an adult human being should have in their body. So toxic sodium, toxic salt levels were the cause of death. It caused his brain to bleed and swell. The manner of death was stated as poisoning though. It didn't say intentional poisoning. It didn't say unintentional poisoning, but we're going to hear some things that made people really kind of wonder. 
The medical examiner even went so far as to first list that Andrew had suffered from blunt force trauma to the head, but he later had to change that part of the report because the high sodium levels could have caused the seeming injuries, like the bruising to his head. Because of the medical examiner's determination of the cause and manner of death was poisoning, there was immediate police homicide investigation into Andrew's death, and Larry and Hannah were told they were not allowed to go into the hospital anymore to see Andrew, to see his body, or to get his things. They were not allowed back into the hospital. Larry and Hannah were actually arrested immediately upon leaving the hospital, and, and their other five children were taken into state custody. So put into foster care. I don't know if they were alone um, together or separate. I don't know, but I know that they were immediately taken into foster care when their parents were immediately arrested for the murder of Andrew Burke. When they were interviewed, the other children told social workers and investigators that when they were bad or when they misbehaved or did something wrong, their punishment was their parents would put quote, spicy stuff, end quote, on their tongues. I didn't really know what to think about this. I never was really punished as a little kid, but I've seen other parents put hot sauce on their kid's tongue. Or if you always see um, movies from like back in the 50s and 60s or shows, if you cursed or cussed, um, your parents would put soap in your mouth. Hannah later explained that she and Larry did in fact put one red pepper flake on a child's tongue if they did something wrong. I don't know what this was a punishment for. But again, I don't really see that it's that bad. It's not like they're pouring, you know, um, the hottest hot sauce in the world down the kid's throat and burning them one red pepper flake um, to teach the kid maybe not to say a bad word or something. CPS immediately uh, reported this to the investigators that were working the homicide case. And one of the immediate questions asked of Hannah by investigators was the obvious, right? Why didn't she call 911? Her simple answer was that she felt she could get to the clinic or hospital. Some sources said clinic, some sources said hospital. Faster than she can call 911, have an ambulance dispatched, and have them come take Andrew's body and bring it to the clinic or hospital. I'm just going to say hospital from now on, as I've been saying. Also remember, the Overtons were not able to make medical decisions. I think I don't know how that worked in an emergency situation. So maybe she figured she'd be able to make medical decisions. This is just speculation on my my part. Um, maybe that's why she, she couldn't make any decisions for him and she maybe was scared to call CPS or didn't want to call CPS and get them involved right away. I wouldn't blame them. I hate CPS. I don't think they do much good. And this, you know, video isn't about that. I'm just saying my own opinion, my own speculation as to why she didn't call 911. They had no um, authority medically over this little boy, but I think in an emergency situation, they may have been able to make some small decisions without having to wait for CPS. And I think she understood how dire and serious the situation was. But that part is speculation. Hannah's behavior during her interviews and allegedly at the hospital while Andrew was being worked on also came under scrutiny and basically under attack. The nurses and doctors told police that they were feverishly doing CPR and trying to save young Andrew's life. Hannah kept smirking and seemed to be smiling to herself and showed no concern at all when they realized he wasn't going to make it, that they weren't going to be able to save him. Is this duper's delight? Smirking and smiling... Also, during her subsequent interviews and interrogations with the police, she was giggling and smiling and laughing and sometimes making jokes. And she seemed even jovial at times when talking about what led up to the death of her foster son. Hannah and those closest to her insist that this is just a nervous tick. This is something that she does when she doesn't know what else to do, when she's uncomfortable. I can totally relate to this. I do what my sisters do, and I think my mom does it. I don't know if I would be doing it in, in this situation, but according to the police and the prosecutors, maybe because Andrew was the only child in the home that was not biologically hers, maybe she didn't love him as much as her biological children, and that's why she reacted this way. Of course, the investigators, the media, and even most of the public turned on the Overtons, especially Hannah, and they were not buying 
this explanation. And to make matters even worse, obviously the investigators had to go and search the Overton home after this happened. And what did they find, right? They found everything that was still out of place from the night before. The dookie sheets on the grill, the bed frame that Andrew slept on with no mattress, and they heard from neighbors and the other children that the Overtons, or Larry specifically, had stripped Andrew naked and hosed him off in the backyard. Later, when they found out about the poop uh, incident, the tantrum, the poop tantrum, the stinky tantrum, they still claim to not understand why any of this was done, and they called it neglectful behavior, and obviously it looked very, very bad for the Overtons. This next statement I'm about to make, I just want to say that I have a lot of problems with it, and I'm going to go immediately into why very quickly. During the trial, the previous foster mother testified for the prosecution. This is the one that was a member of the congregation that suggested to the Overtons maybe she adopt young Andrew that went along for it. And that was the first one to kind of explain his developmental issues, his delays, and his problems. She said that while Andrew did have some behavioral issues, he really wasn't a difficult child and he had no food issues whatsoever when he was in her care. Let me tell you my problem with this, okay? She testifies this for the prosecution. She was the only one in the church that ever fostered Andrew, to the best of my knowledge and to the best of what's reported, right? So if he didn't have these food issues, if he didn't have these crazy ta temper tantrums and wasn't an um, unruly child, then why did the pastor and his wife back out? Why did everyone in the, not everyone, but why did so many people in the congregation after speaking to her come and warn the Overtons or maybe suggest to the Overtons not to take on Andrew as a foster child because all of his problems, especially the eating. I think she's a liar. I think she just wanted to be a part of the case more than she already was. I'm calling you out, previous foster mom. Also, I want to know, why was she so quick to go along with this adoption to have Andrew out of her custody and hand him over to the Overtons if she loved him so much and he was such a delightful little boy with hardly any, any temper tantrums and no food issues and very, you know, small behavioral issues? Why didn't she adopt him? I mean, there's many, many reasons why, you know, she that could be why she didn't adopt him, but I mean you know, you want to judge somebody else. I, I didn't see you stepping up to the plate, you know, and if the child was that well-behaved and wonderful, then, you know, you have to consider what are her motives. She was interviewed on, you know, news shows and national media. What were her motives? I also want to state that when I was little and I would get sick and I was put on like a liquid diet by my doctor, my mother, and then my father would give me ice chips and um, hot water with chicken or beef bouillon. I still drink it when I'm sick as an adult or even on like a freezing cold night. If I don't have any hot chocolate and I don't feel like having tea, I will drink a bouillon cube, a large one, either chicken, beef, or vegetable, tomato, whatever, bouillon. And or the bouillon um, powder in hot water and I will drink it. I've also tried a couple times to give this to RJ. RJ loves broth. So I make homemade chicken soup. I'll make a pop this big with bouillon and water and put other ingredients in it and give RJ several servings. So no, I don't see anything weird about her giving him Creole seasoning in water. I'm sorry. Um, like I said, respectfully disagree. I would love to have some back and forth about this to see what you guys think. However, my opinion doesn't matter. On September 7th, 2007, Hannah was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. She said she was so shocked she had been out on bail. She didn't even say goodbye to her children that morning because she, she was convinced and so sure that she was going to be coming home that night after the trial ended. Larry was also charged with murder, which I really don't understand how he was even involved in this because he wasn't even home. But I think all of the abuse allegations, which we're going to find out bogus, um, he was also charged with murder. But after Hannah's eventual conviction, Larry was put on probation. He accepted a plea deal. And once that probation was over, the sources say the way it's written that the charges were dropped, but I think that means that 
since he completed his probation without any further issue or problems, it was probably expunged off of his record. He was now a single father to five children, dealing with the loss of his foster son, who he loved very, very much, and of his wife, who is now doing life in prison. Another, another thing I find very unfair and unreasonable and kind of unconstitutional, I don't know if it's unconstitutional, but it really kind of grinded my gears, that the jury was only given two options in this case. Guilty of first degree murder, intentional first degree capital murder and life in, for life in prison or a complete acquittal. There was no in between. So the jury either had to sentence her to life or let her go. I research and watch tons and tons of these cases. I've been researching and watching these cases, reading about these cases, true crime books, everything I can get my hands on since I'm like 10, 11, 12 years old. Okay. And usually there's some kind of in between. There's some kind of option for the jury. That's just in my opinion. And again, disagree in the comments if you want. That's not fair. But don't cry for Hannah yet because it came out later that the high sodium levels were only the result of testing stomach content and not blood. Hannah appealed her sentence when she found this out and the, and the Court of Appeals did grant her a new trial. The church raised a million dollars for her defense and three of the top and best lawyers in the state, three of the top lawyers, defense lawyers in the state decided to work together for free to help get Hannah's conviction overturned once all of this new evidence came out. And one of the original prosecutors from this case that had gotten Hannah convicted came out and testified for the defense in her second trial. It came out that in the hospital before he passed away, while he was in his coma, Andrew was given saline, saline through an IV for at least two hours of his hospital stay. This obviously added even more to the levels of sodium or salt that were already in his system. Also, nobody took in, into consideration and decided to search the cabinet and see what baking ingredients Andrew could have gotten into. Baking ingredients could have salt in them. Do you know what I'm saying? Like nobody wanted to see any other option than this woman, you know, purposely murdered her foster child. And these are all things that came up in the second trial. In addition to all of this new evidence, it was also brought up that massive amounts of sodium in someone's system like young Andrew had prevents the blood from clotting and therefore all of the bruises that were considered to be from physical abuse from either Hannah or the Overtons was more than likely actually caused by the heroic attempts at resuscitation by hospital staff and medical technicians involved in trying to save his life. So basically with that high of assault content, any minor bump or bruise would have caused bruising under the skin and the extensive and aggressive life-saving techniques done by all the hospital and medical staff probably caused all of the internal bleeding and bruises that the doctors and the medical examiner saw all over Andrew. So essentially, these bruises were not on him when he got to the hospital. They were a result of, you know, any little bump or bruise and they're pressing on you to do CPR and they're handling you and they're putting, you know, tubes in you. All of these bruises came from the heroic efforts of life saving that the hospital staff and emergency technicians and doctors and even the medical examiner um, doing his job, they had caused all these bruises. It wasn't from abuse. Andrew was not abused. Hannah won her appeal in 2014 and was acquitted and declared innocent of all charges in the murder of Andrew Bird, which was now considered to be an accident. She was set free that very day after spending seven years in prison. She also came to some kind of gigantic settlement. She sued the state. I think she came at like $600 million or something like that. So what do you guys think? This video is super duper long. I do have a lot to edit out, but I think it's still going to be about an hour or a little bit more. I hope you stayed with me. My average view time is still not very good. I'm getting a ton of views, but view time, not so good. Um, 
So what do you guys think? Let's talk about it in the comments. Let's have some true crime discussion, please. Because I've stated my opinion and my ideas. And I want to see if you agree or disagree. Um, a lot of people that don't have children were, you know, from what I saw on YouTube and from what I read in other people reporting on this and listened to in podcasts, a lot of people without children thought that she may have done it. I 100% believe that she is 100, 1000% innocent. Do you fall somewhere in between? Do you have children? Do you not have children? What do you think about the actions? What do you think was the most bizarre? What do you think that was taken as bizarre was the most reasonable? Let me know, guys. If you are not already subscribed, please be sure to subscribe to my channel just to let you know. Yes, this is true crime. I also cover paranormal stories, um, anything bizarre and weird. But this is an addiction and recovery channel. And I am here to help the recovering addicts like myself. So I also post videos like that, usually on Sundays. But my schedule's been a little bit messed up. Be sure to like. Give me that massive thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. And please comment. Be kind to each other, guys. You never know how you're going to affect someone else with just a smile. The joy you can bring to someone's day because you guys do it for me all the time in the comments. You make me smile when I'm down. You motivate me. You give me strength. You make me feel confident to keep coming out with new content. I love you all. Whether you're here from the beginning um, or whether you just got here. Thank you so much to everyone who always supports me and have your best day. I will see you tomorrow, most likely for addiction and recovery, but I may throw a paranormal story quick in there as well. It depends how much time I have. Bye, guys.